Hello, hello, everybody. It's 12.08 a.m. Central Time on the 7th of April, 2023. It's Friday here in the United States. I hope you're doing well. We are here to talk about seismic events. I've got a big warning going for this week. We're just going to start this update out very quickly. We're not going to do any jib-jab. We're going to talk about the big earthquake we're looking for over here in the West Pacific starting today for the next 7 to 10 days. So basically a week and a half we are watching in the West Pacific in particular in between all of our deep earthquakes for the potential of an extremely large quake to develop up to and possibly above 8.0. I'm basing that on us already being at the 7.0 level when I issued the warning with the new 7 that struck at Papua New Guinea. We are warning the area just east of, next to all of our deep earthquakes over to the east on our letter D, and over to the west on our letter Ds. We're sandwiched in between the two, and that's where I'm looking for another step up to take place. And like I said, it could go upper 7, low 8, somewhere in the really large earthquake range. When we get up to 8, I mean, if we're at 7 now and we go up to 8, that's like 10 more 7s to get to, to go from a 7 to an 8. That's basically 10 more 7s added in, just to give you a size perspective on the increase we're looking for. It's based upon the deep earthquake activity happening down below the West Pacific. You can see our deep earthquakes raised high off the planet, and they're spread from South America all the way where this would be the middle in between the spot to the west over at Malaysia and Philippines all the way to South America, and in between the two is where we've got the big warning going. So I don't normally have to issue warnings for really big earthquakes, and when I do, I take the time to really drive home the point that we need to be prepared. If it strikes in the ocean versus on land, it'll be a big difference. If it's in the ocean, we will see most likely some kind of tsunami warning on that that would spread out around the area region-wise. On an 8, you would expect the region to get a tsunami. Anything above an 8, when you get to the level of like the Japan mega quake back in 2011, that sends out a, what's called a Pacific-wide or an ocean-wide tsunami warning. And that's with the mega quakes. This would be a very large quake, but not to the level of what I don't think to the level of what Japan was. Okay, that's a whole order higher Japan back 2011. So that's the good news. Now, if you watched my video yesterday, you know that we're also watching for several other large earthquakes to take place that are similar in size to what's already struck. And like I said, we already had a 7 and mid-range 6s. So we're looking for this to take the next step up. If we're at mid-range 6, we should see the next step up, which goes up to upper 6, low 7s. But not in the spots where we are now. We look for this to spread out and away. Thus, my warnings for areas like Iran all the way over here. We have a warning going for an upper 6 to low 7 to strike in eastern Iran next to Pakistan and Afghanistan's border. We also have a warning going for a potential large earthquake over here in Indonesia. That's another spot where we have the warning. You guys can go watch my video from yesterday. This is not intended to be a new forecast, just to remind you that we've issued several warnings now that stand for the next 7 to 10 days. We have a warning going for South America along the coast of Chile for a potential large earthquake, upper 6 to low 7 as well. So it's several spots we're looking for this activity to go to. Uh, another spot where we're watching is north of New Zealand, and all of these spots should be hit. I won't be satisfied if it's just, just one, although I'm not looking for this, you know, I'm not happy. When I say satisfied, I mean with the earthquake forecasting. So, you know, it's again, we're not just looking for one quake in all these areas where I'm talking about, you know, like one in a seven chance. We're looking for every one of these areas that I'm talking about to get hit with an extremely large quake or significant event in the next 7 to 10 days. And I'm basing that again on all the deep earthquakes. The earth looks like a pincushion at this point. This is the last 2 to 3 days of deep quakes and this is not the full picture on the deep quakes. So there's actually more that we just don't see. 
Oh, with there being more than this, you can imagine it even more as a pincushion. And that means there's something going on down below the plates. Now today, a new six struck up here to the north right next to our deep earthquake. This four, this deep four struck last night, followed by a shallow six up above it and USGS 5.9. Swarming out now in central Aleutian Island chain and a new four, but the swarm is the increase, the stack of earthquakes at that location. So, Aleutians started to move with a new swarm and a new 6 up to the north. We're looking for this to go up to 6.5. Today is the last day of the warning and it has not hit. Anchorage down south to the plate boundary. Today is the last day of the warning tonight. Well, I mean, it pretty much expires right now, actually. At midnight, my, 15 minutes ago, the warning expired for Anchorage. We're looking for 7 days. I probably should have issued it for 10, but... You know, hindsight's 2020, so I issued a seven-day warning for this, and it did not hit. So here we are. We are literally expiring right now for Anchorage, and I'll give it a few hours. I mean, we have a six over to the west. Nothing's progressed over to Anchorage. It's all stayed over to the west over the past seven days. But now we're swarming in the Aleutians, so something's coming across now. You can see it coming across. Next step over is here in a 6.3 to 6.5. It's the only spot that has not been hit from this past week. Let's jump over across Asia and go over into Europe. That's the flow. That's the way the flow goes. We have a warning going in China. This goes right here at the Nepal-China border region, and that could go into the mid-range 6th level, 6.3 to 6.5. Could be even bigger, but I've put a cap on it at 6.3 to 6.5 just because of all the other 6.3s and 6.5s striking across the West Pacific. I limited the number there. I, if it goes any bigger, again, we'll have to get into why that would happen. But I'm looking for the big earthquake to strike here for the region and then spread over to the West. But I'm not going to issue a warning to the West yet until we see the activity here. Like a flowing river, we wouldn't warn the people far downstream until we see the flow come and know what size the flow of the river is. Anyway, if you know anybody in Iran, I don't know if you do. <laughs> Same for Afghanistan and Pakistan. You may know someone there. Let them know. Next 7 to 10 days, right here, south Iran, right at the border, going north to central Iran, right at the borders again, where all three countries come together, Afghanistan on the north side, Pakistan on the south side, Iran on the west side. Upper 6 to low 7, devastating quake. Most likely going to strike. Now back over to the west, we go into Turkey, and actually the number of earthquakes started to go back up. We call this a frequency increase back in Turkey. So it's not size-wise, it's not terribly impressive yet, but the number of earthquakes is certainly lit back up, wouldn't you say, if you've been pe keeping track over the past few days? Take a look. I mean, it is. It's a definitive line of earthquakes, but it's going a different direction. Check it out. Instead of bending down to the south, like previously, where we had our six and our line of earthquakes making an arc shape or a bending shape to the south. It's now going straight up over to the west, over to this new 4.2. Now, let me show you something here. The USGS has this quake reported 4.2, but on the USGS map is what I want to show. So previously, we were going in Turkey. Make, make sure you can see all this. Previously, we were going in Turkey from here across and bending down across the red line, down towards Cyprus, the island here, Cyprus. And now we are going over to the west this way, not following the plate boundary. The breaking is taking place now over to the west. So let's go see what's at the location. I don't know what resides at the spot. Got to put the coordinates in over on Google Earth. We're looking up the four out in front of the whole mess of small earthquakes. One more time, take a look at it. It's like a mess or a line of small earthquakes leading over to the bigger one over to the west on land. Meanwhile, the plate boundary goes to the south where these twos and the three are. So what's going on there? Well, I don't know. I don't know what's there. Let's go see. I don't know what that is. It's a, a river, but I don't know what that place is. Uh-oh. Hold on. No way. Guys, hold on. It is. No freaking way. Is that what it looks like? It is. 
hydroelectric power right there of all the places to be wow all right okay it is what it is i always promise to show everything that i find this ties in with the electrical generation quakes that we see this is phenomenal actually so we've spread over next to the power station now the power station we should talk about this so we've got the dams we've got a obviously you've got a dam here and it's coming down and it looks like you're bringing it in from up to the north where the the uh, is is that what this is that's what this looks like it, again we, we looks like we've got a some kind of power generation going on here that's what this appears to be the flowing water going through it very low frequency electricity whether it's 60 hertz 120 180 transmission line level electri electricity very powerful being generated generating an electromagnetic field that goes down into the crust mother nature generating a very low frequency that's down in the crust electrical in nature passing through this area now mother nature's wave is passing along this red line let's go back and take a look along this red line going down to the south down towards cyprus but then we have a power generation station here over to the west and the earthquakes are making a beeline right for it that's the wave making a beeline right for path of least resistance to the spot that's already vibrating very low frequency similar in frequency whether it's 60 hertz 120 or 180 i don't know but mother nature's wave is being attracted at that point as opposed to making the hard bend and going down to the south path of least resistance you put a vibrating source here from humans vibrating electric that is uh, oscillating electric very low frequency electric and you start doing that in the crust we don't just start it's going vibrating in the crust and it's electrical in nature the wave seeks these places out happens over in the united states this way we see this next to our natural gas power stations coal fire power stations solar wind and nuclear and along the transmission lines as well i've been documenting this for several years it was a topic of discussion in my video yesterday for the united states now here we are in turkey and we spread over to the power station in turkey so people were in denial about it professionals they were saying it was not possible and it was just chance that but we don't listen to that anymore this not possible just chance stuff they said that about fracking earthquakes turns out i was right on that they said that i'm not being egotistical i'm just saying i 2010 2011 i was called a conspiracy theorist and tree hugger for saying that drill points and earthquakes were related they said there was no relation that's just fracking earthquakes so we're not going to listen to any denial on this we're going right over to it it's indisputable we're right next to it it's you'd have to just think of his chance and you'd have to think all the other spots are just chance too and now that we're numbering in the thousands of spots that are being hit next to power stations I'm gonna have to say it i think it's pretty much a slam dunk maybe somebody could get their doctoral thesis on this out of some kind of university writing a paper on it because i stand by it it's, it's true it's, it's happening you can go look into it yourself if you want to make a name for yourself now speaking of that not making a name for yourself just uh, the documentation of it the flow of earthquakes going around romania the same size as what struck in poland yesterday so we have threes going all the way around the outside edge of europe i talked about this in my video yesterday about poland well, now we have a three back down in Romania. And it's not that we're flowing from Poland down to you for Romania. It's that we're going around Romania and back up through Poland. And this wave is dropping off threes all the way along the way. We're looking at everything 2.0 and greater. So threes are going around the outside edge of the plate, going through Greece, following our arrow perfectly. It struck on the backside of our arrow yesterday. And yesterday we went up here to our four point something quake. That the USGS, by the way, I think they ignored it, did they? Yeah. USGS omitted and ignored that four up at the North Mid-Atlantic Ridge yesterday. So if you're following the USGS site, you just don't know. I guess that's why I get subscribers still, because I'm making you aware of earthquakes that they don't tell you about. And it was a 4.2 to 4.3. And before you tell me that the USGS doesn't cover 4.2s and 4.3s internationally, 
let me point you to the 4.2 that the USGS covered right here in Turkey. <laughs> or this 4.3 that they're covering over in the middle of the ocean in Indonesia. Or this 4.3 out there in the middle of the ocean down below it. Or so forth. I mean, again, USGS cherry-picking the quakes to show you. So if you didn't know, Mid-Atlantic Ridge got hit yesterday. Let's go out to Hawaii. Hawaii! Guys, are you ready for me to come invade? It's just going to be me. It's a one-man invasion. Well, no, no, I'm sorry. It's me and Duchess. That's right. I could never leave her here. Me, Duchess, and the cats. So it's really like a two-and-a-half person landing force here. Anyway, check it out. Mauna Loa started to move a little bit, and I noticed Doing Hawaii and Two Pineapples both have their streams running again. Or maybe they were always running, but I noticed they're repopulated and there's some people in there. There might be something worth observing at the volcanoes now. I don't know, but you should go check their channels, Two Pineapples and Doing Hawaii. And they live there, and they cover the volcanoes regularly and show all the USGS info and talk about it and go up there and stuff. It's really cool. They go to all the conferences, too, and record that and get the Q&As from the professionals. Really cool stuff. Big shout-out also to somebody who I would never normally shout-out, which is the Hawaii Volcano Observatory. Serious. I'm not, I'm not being sarcastic or anything. Um, for their conferences and for the other things that they did in regards to the volcanoes here, I went back and watched just for nerd's sake. And I can't disagree with anything that was said or done in the time that the two volcanoes erupted this time. Well, hold on, hold on. Except for the moving of that damn webcam. Okay. That was the only, that was the only, you know, come on, man. But other than that, everything else was perfect on the way they covered it, the way they handled it uh, versus the mainstream media and, and uh, them debunking the media while not downplaying the volcano. The lava flows, nobody got hurt. They managed to keep everybody away. And in the same breath, the coverage on it was nonstop. We, there wasn't a day that's gone by now that we haven't had a good shot of the volcano in some way. So that's cool. And just big shout out for everybody who made that happen. And that diffuses... Obviously, that diffuses. And I think a lesson should be learned from all the professionals that if you hide something or try and like keep it on the on the wraps, that's when the suspicion grows and and tourism falls off and everything. But when you confront it head on, it becomes a, a wonder of science that everybody wants to see, or at least they don't mind being around. So Mauna Loa erupting didn't scare away all the tourists in tourist season. Turned out it was something they were like, oh wow, cool, because of the way everybody responded. Anyway. So, what's going on here now? I, I don't know if there's an increase in eruptive activity. We are looking for an increase in seismic to go up. The number of earthquakes and the magnitude to take a step back up. It's going up across the board. We're, we're looking for Alaska to go. It hasn't been hit yet, but six is all around the board. Seven's down on the west. Bunch of deep earthquakes. It's pretty much a no-brainer. We're going to be going back up in Hawaii by a magnitude and a half. We're going to probably be topping out in the upper four range again. Right back down, most likely in the middle of the mess. Back down to Pahala. It's like a giant triangle, and we're looking in the middle of it, or a giant target or whatever, right in the middle. And in the middle where all the quakes are, That's just find that center point, centered between Captain Cook to the west and all the way down to Pahala, and then down to Loihi out in the ocean. And that halfway, or the triangulated point between all three puts us at Pahala. So watch Pahala, upper four. It's enough to knock things off shelves. It's enough to wake you up in the middle of the night. And if things get knocked off shelves in the middle of the night, you should probably have a set of shoes by the side of your bed. I mean, if you're in Hawaii, you already know this. Maybe the tourists don't know, though. Tourists might watch this. It doesn't mean it's going to blast or anything, guys. Don't worry. It's no huge Mount St. Helens or anything like that. No lava flowing out underneath your hotels or your rental places. Anyway, don't worry about that. We're just worried about the seismic. It's enough to knock things off shelves. And get, if it happens at night, that's when things, people get injured. Okay, all right. U.S. 48, lower 48. Let's go down here. Oklahoma. Oklahoma. This happens so many times when I do my updates. Yesterday, I... Here, let me take you over to my YouTube page here really quick. Hold on. So here I am 19 hours ago doing my update. So basically yesterday. And I talk about Oklahoma... And I show in that video from yesterday, this quake, the three. And I'm on here looking and I'm complaining about it being a three. And I issued the warning for a four. 
And I'm like, guys, we're looking for a four to hit here. Let's go look at the technical detail information. This is me yesterday. I open it up. I scroll down the list. I'm like, looks like it was probably a three. Where's the four that we're looking for? I'd issued the warning for a mid-range four, the first in months, to come back into Oklahoma. And the reason we warned Oklahoma for 4.0 level activity is because of the 4.0 level activity rolling in on the West Coast. And the fives that were striking up here. And the swarm at Yellowstone. Now let me show you a graphic here. This graphic, the Craton graphic. I talk about the Craton all the time, but you need to see it. If you're a new viewer, there it is. Look at the rusty brownish color. Now look where it goes. It goes from Montana and Idaho right down through Yellowstone at Wyoming. Then it goes down through Colorado, central Colorado on the continental divide, down through New Mexico, and makes a bend through Texas. Now look at the earthquakes. Let me turn off all the numbers and maybe turn down the rings a little bit. This is two days worth of quakes. Here's the whole week. It's a perfect match for the craton edges, plural, for the accretionary belt of coastal plain, for the deformed edge going across over into Utah, pointing like a round arrow or a parenthesis shape over to the rusty brownish color, and then going down through Texas, back up to Oklahoma, and up the East Coast. Look at it. It's a stepping stone path. It matches perfect. Now, why am I making such a big deal about this? This was said to never be possible to happen. I showed this to professionals ten year, nine years ago. Nine years ago, I showed this to professionals. And they first said I was cherry-picking the earthquakes and to make it look like there was a progression. <laughs> then they, when they realized I wasn't cherry-picking quakes, they then came back and said it was chance or coincidence. And they left it there. They would not review, and still have not to this day, will not review my findings, even though I published them and sent them straight to them. Now, the reason is because they said... There's mathematical equations that say that one earthquake cannot cause the other. Therefore, fours on the West Coast cannot cause fours in the Midwest along the edge of the Craton. And my response to that is, I'm not saying that fours on the West Coast are causing fours at the oil pumping operations in the Midwest. I'm saying that the fours on the West Coast and the fours at the pumping operations in the Midwest and the fours up to the Northeast that are going to strike in the next few days that aren't even on here now are caused by a wave that's going across the whole plate and it's dropping off the earthquakes along the way. And there's not much loss since it's a very low frequency, high power wave. There's not much loss. They go from a 4.4 down to a 4.2, for instance. All right. But it's not that one earthquake is causing the other. One's one day, one's the other takes about a day for the wave to vibrate through the plate and go up and cause the next quake where the wave rises up next and so we should see a new four over on the east coast i've got a warning going for delaware and look a new earthquake struck on the east coast last night yesterday new york and in between the two we have a two down here right at the border of south carolina and north carolina and the half what would you say the halfway point is between these two quakes if we just connect between the two in a straight line straight line brings us into West Virginia. But I have a warning going just next to it right here. So my warning's going for the Delaware, D.C., Eastern Virginia area. And we're watching for the same sized earthquakes to go across the whole plate. So right now, we're right there. Now the weird thing is, when I made my video yesterday, this earthquake hadn't hit. I finished my update. 30 minutes goes by. I upload it to YouTube. We're sitting there in the chat room waiting for the thing to premiere. And my chat room starts to fill up over on YouTube with people like, I just got woke. It was late, late night last night, 19 hours ago. I just got woken up. Earthquake just hit here in Oklahoma. Dutch, earthquake, your earthquake just hit. The one you were looking for. And I'm like, guys, my video is getting ready to premiere. I'm going off of myself for missing. So let's go pull the coordinates. I shouldn't beat myself up, should I? You ever see a meteorologist beat themselves up? over being wrong. Speaking of meteorologists, I've got something phenomenal to show you in about two seconds. But first I want to show you this. Here's the earthquake epicenter. Maybe two seconds is an exaggeration. In about two minutes, I'm going to show you something phenomenal. So out here, taking a look out across Oklahoma. See where it says slider pumps? <laughs> Down in here, we've got a bunch of oil and gas pumping operations, fracking ops. You can see the head of the wells here. You see the shadow of the jack of the pump. Okay, 
that's just one example they're kind of nestled out here into the woods there's 550,000 different drill points across Oklahoma last time I checked and that was a couple of years ago the pumping operations are absolutely massive and they go on for miles all the way around the area that was just one that I zoomed in on and that's the one that's right next to the spot that broke now what they do is they'll drill down at an angle sometimes over by miles in many cases and they're doing that of course to get oil and gas and they will do it right on the back side of people's properties they'll do it down the sides of roads let me see if i can find another one in here they'll do it down the sides of road here here's one right here this is like an older one you see the protective berm that's built around there these actually hold chemicals and what they'll do is they'll take water fresh water mix it with the chemicals and pump it down into the ground and then it breaks apart the shale releasing the oil and gas they'll even do that in old oil wells then they'll drill in at an angle and pump it out and they'll do that by up to four or five miles now here at Cushing Oklahoma is one of their storage areas for the natural gas and it's absolutely massive look at the size of that storage facility but here all around it drilled and that's where the earthquake is now we were looking for this to happen we had issued the warning for this over uh, six days ago going back to my YouTube channel going down here three days five days seven days so starting right here seven days ago now and then five and then three talking about watching Oklahoma for four point zero level activity then yesterday I get on and beat myself up when a three hits and say ah oh, looks like I missed and then within 30 minutes the four hit okay oh wow that matters right so it matters when there's a flow going across the plate you need to pay attention to it professional said it couldn't happen turns out it happens every week and one more time you can see it it's like a big U shape that goes down across and back up the East Coast now there is an earthquake a rare earthquake that struck up here in Kansas following the 4.2 it's a 3.2 or is it let's go look at the magnitudes and just see what the local magnitudes are showing we throw out the high end and we throw out the low end it looks like the high end is upper threes mid to upper threes I don't see any fours on the list okay it matters to me again it, I just have to look it up to see are the magnitudes matching on the stations versus what the personal cubicle is showing let's go up into Kansas and show you what's here because I found something here last night that was just phenomenal and I do want you to see it. This does tie in with very low frequency and earthquakes. So what I was telling you about the power plants, okay, the power plants over in Turkey and very low frequency. Well, when I back this out and turn on our borders and labels and you see where we are in Kansas, there we are. See where it says Salina? And do you see where it says Manhattan? And do you see where it says Lindsborg? We're going to go back over to the USGS map, and I'm going to show you on their map what's there. See these grayed out areas, this area and this area? Let me zoom in. Fort Riley Military Reservation and Smoky Hill Weapons Range, and we're centered in between the two on the other side of the highway. If you've ever driven through here, you can drive, you drive west to go out to Colorado, for instance. But that then got me suspicious so I decided to zoom in on the area a little bit and look around and and what I found was somewhat interesting and I just wanted to bring my viewers in with a closer view and show you what I found so we have a giant man-made lake here of course it dammed it up right there we've got the military base here and well, lo and behold, in the middle of this thing is the bombing range that's right here. And you can see all their little roads and everything in the range where they pull the tanks out to. And I'm not kidding, it's tanks. Because all of this is the big military motor pool and depot. Let me just, I couldn't believe it. I go, motor pool? Motor pool for what? Well, it turns out it's a motor pool for all the military vehicles. Uh, huge, well, not all of them, but just... You know, tanks and Bradleys at M1 A1 Abrams, I think, are even out in here. Yeah, take a look at howitzer-type tanks. Okay. Now, the bombing range is right in the middle of this thing. And you might notice that it has a certain shape to it, which is really interesting. 
But the most interesting thing that I found about this is that it's pointing somewhere. It's pointing over here to Topeka, to the Nexrad radar station, which is right here at the airport, on the edge of the airport, which is kind of rare. We don't normally have the Nexrad, oh wait, we don't normally have the Nexrad radars at the airport directly. They have a, also a ground level dish that's pretty interesting and another ground-based radar here, which is really interesting. Maybe TDWR terminal Doppler. Okay, now I measured it and, I, and it really does. It really does point exactly to the Nexrad radar station. Now, I wouldn't have found any of this stuff if it weren't for the earthquake striking below it on the back side. Now, this has happened, well, I want to say it's happened 20 times. I'll just pull a number out of the air. It's probably more than that, but 20 times this has happened in the past few months. And going back to last year, when I started to notice and the military bases in the middle of each one of these triangular shaped that that by the way that feature is eh, 50 miles long 50 to 60 miles long on each side and it's made out of natural features supposedly but we're finding these all over the world and we're finding military bases in the middle of each one but they're ancient the structures or the the shape is an ancient shape and the military base in the middle of each one proves the military is using them, but it's just getting odd. The only way I'm finding these are the earthquakes are striking below them or next to them. And my eye is drawn to it, and the next thing you know, I'm finding out that at the pinnacle tip of many of them are giant radio facilities. Big microwave towers, radar stations. Very odd. There's no way anybody built something 50 miles long 500 years ago or something. There's just no way. No way. Uh, well, a Great Wall of China, but how many thousands of years did that take? Okay, anyway, let's go look at the earthquakes out on the West Coast. Now that you've seen some weird stuff, let's go out here over on the West Coast and see what's going on, if there's any changes that need to be documented here. Well, all right, well, there is a change. I would say this is an increase in earthquakes across Washington, but I have to go check and see if there are earthquakes. Hold on. Ah. Uh, see? This is where we get off the rails, class. So we have an explosion here. Uh, I, that's why I raised question to these all being earthquakes, because there's so many going on across the state all at once. It makes you wonder what's going on. Let's go see. An explosion, but where? Oh. Farm field? Is that what it is? Out here in a farm field. Pretty interesting. Because right across town, right here, is the Hanford Nuclear Waste Storage Facility and the old experimental reactors from the Manhattan Project and the LIGO Gravity Wave Sensing Station. Station, station. Gravity wave. Come on, guys. Say it with me. Gravity wave. Guys, I want to show you something. You ready? Wake up. Look. Look at this. If there is no spoon, then there is no red or blue pill either. Now, what I want you to see is this. Lincoln County, Missouri, hit by gravity wave. A rare weather event that ripped off a roof. St. Louis meteorologist's best guess at what caused damage Tuesday evening is a rare wind event. So my local news, well, not just NBC, but several of the meteorologists in our local area made note of a rare weather event that took place 20 miles away from the Nexrad radar. Now, I'd like to remind everybody, last week... Last week, a story came out about the St. Louis Nexrad radar going down for upgrades. And everybody threw a fit because there was this big storm last Friday that was coming through. And the National Weather Service said they would postpone the upgrade for a minute or whatever. Till after the storm went through. So then the storm went through. 
And I don't know if they shut the radar off or not to do the upgrade. But then, all of a sudden, 72 hours after they did the upgrade, or 72 hours after the storm blew through, I don't know if they did the upgrade, this happened. This strange weather event, which they're calling a gravity wave, And at the end of the article, I'd like to quote our local meteorologist on this because this is truly a -a once-in-a-lifetime type weather event. Tuesday's gravity wave was a first for Deitch at the National Weather Service office. And Weather First Chief Meteorologist Scott Connell has worked on Five on Your Side for 32 years here in St. Louis. And he does not recall any situations like this. And it's a gravity wave, they're calling it. Now, big shout out to all the meteorologists who are covering this. And it is something that you probably haven't seen in your entire career because of the new Klystron upgrade at the freaking next right. Guys, my big discovery is that there's a electromagnetic disturbance that happens when the next rad radar is pulsed. The Klystron in particular, when it's pulsed in high frequency, not in microwave. When there's a high frequency pulse that comes from the Klystron when they're tuning it, and that there's a reverberation weather effect that happens within 72 hours after that electromagnetic disturbance vibrates back and forth like a standing wave in the atmosphere for up to two to three days. Think of like the strings on a guitar vibrating for three days, and they're getting plucked like harp, but this is the radar station, And it vibrates back and forth, and it forms a standing wave. And that standing wave then has a weather electron cascade effect. Electron cascade is stripping of electrons from the atmosphere. But you can't see any of this. This is all invisible to the human eye. It's following electromagnetic field field lines of the Earth going around the radar station out to 50 nautical miles and 100 nautical miles. And I challenge every single meteorologist who's listening to me now and anybody who's into the weather to start watching your next rad radars at 50 nautical miles and 100 nautical miles exactly. And what you are going to see is that the storms are forming and being zapped off at the exact 50 and 100 nautical mile range from the radars themselves. And I can prove that by showing you any one of the radars across the United States to prove that. You could look at any next rad radar, look out at the 50 nautical mile range, which it's marked in a ring here, and out at the 100. It sees further out, obviously. You can see out two, three, four hundred miles. But watch as the storms take the formation and go around the outside edge of the 50 nautical mile range till an inundating burst comes in and it gets zapped off. Then we form into waves that match the rotation of the radar, and this is actually matched in the one hour and storm total precipitations, the shape of the radar itself with its pinwheel-like nature going out. This is actual precipitation. Look. (laughs) Inches. And it takes the actual shape of the radar. It's not the radar do like just an artifact. The actual storms themselves break apart into equidistantly spaced storms that take the shape of the rotation of the radar. This is storm total precipitation, guys. This is not looking at reflectivity. Look, it's making a bend around the outside edge. If you know what I'm talking about, this is the reflectivity, and you'll even see it in the storms themselves. Not natural, of course, when you get this kind of formation of storms spreading out along the field lines of the radar. And the hook-like formation that forms on the edge of a pinwheel-like nature, which you can see in the correlation coefficient, much better. I'm digressing, but I have to show this because they're talking about gravity waves, and you want to see it? Here, let me show you an example. So the spacing on these, this is actual storm. The space, you can definitely tell on the equidistant spacing and the pinwheel-like nature of the rotation of the radar and what it does to the storms. So the spacing. That's not natural. It's spoke-like. And it's not a process of observation that's causing it because you can see it. Watch this. Look at the bouncing around of the electromagnetic field in the storm itself. And the precipitation is reflected by this. This is where the major precipitation is happening, guys. And you can see the spiral-like nature. One, two, three, four, five. And just in case you're wondering about that spiral-like nature. Harpering Radar Dutch Synths should bring up plenty 
of shots of this. Here, here's somebody who's documented it. It's in another language from back from 2011. But what you're going to see here in about two seconds comes from her right before Hurricane Katrina. Do you see the pinwheel-like nature of the rotation of the radar all the way back in the late 90s with the first version of the WSR-88? Next rad radar, but do you see the pinwheel-like shape, right? Okay, that same shape shows up in the actual storms now, and the storm total precipitation is reflecting that. The storms are actually dropping the rain in that shape. The next rad is influencing the weather. It's not chance that we are going in like this at every freaking station across the country. Go down to Louisiana, I'll do the same thing. I don't know, I just randomly click on any one, we can do it. Because it's happening at every single station. And I think they know. I think that people at the National Weather Service at a high level have to know. There's no way they couldn't know when you start getting formation like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and it's going in a spiral like shape, and the spiral is very tight spiral now. It's not the big wide one that you've got back in the nineties. But come on, guys. Spoke like nature. Storm totals matching. And it goes through the whole storm that way as the radar is rotating. And it's not a process of observation that's doing this. These are the storm totals. Look, the spoke like nature of the actual storm. And it's rotating. So it makes it like a spiral or a vortex. Now, why am I taking all the time to talk about this? We're back to the gravity wave thing. So my local meteorologists are talking about a gravity wave forming on the side of the radar, which I told you last week to watch that radar for something weird to happen around that radar. Me last week, watch this radar for something weird to happen. Here we are this week. Never happened in the entire 32 years that I've been watching, or I've been here 47 years. I've never seen it either. So he's been doing the weather for 32 years, never seen it. And not just him, all the meteorologists. So then getting back over to why do gravity waves matter? Well, why do they build a gravity wave sensing station next to all the nuclear material here? Wait a second. Hold on. Why did they build the NEXRAD radar here in St. Louis right here? Why did they build it next to the nuclear stockpile? Here's the nuclear stockpile. Weldon Springs nuclear stockpile right across the road right here. Weldon Springs NEXRAD radar. Now, wait a second, because again, why did they build the gravity wave sensing station right next to the nuclear stockpile over here in Richland, Washington? Gravity wave sensing station next to nuclear stockpile here. Next rad next to nuclear stockpile over in St. Louis producing gravity wave. It all ties together. You know how this ties together? I feel like Mel Gibson in that movie Conspiracy Theory with Julia Roberts, where Captain Picard plays a CIA agent. And Mel Gibson's a cab driver, but he's a conspiracy nut, and he runs a newsletter. And in the movie Conspiracy Theory, his conspiracy newsletter is saying that NASA has the space shuttle earthquake weapon. And that it's going to be used to take out the elite leadership of the United States. And that they have an orbiting earthquake weapon. This is in the movie. Go back and watch it in the movie Conspiracy Theory. But in there, he's got this secret room where he's really psycho. And he, he's taken all the string and he's tied it together across the room like some weird conspiracy theorist. <laughs> okay. Well, that's what I just did here with the gravity wave thing. But it actually is making sense to me. Go figure. I just tried to explain it to you. I hope you understand. Why does it matter? Gravity waves, very low frequency, earthquake effect. That's why it matters. And weird weather effect up in the sky. Here's something to watch out for. A weird, rare, small earthquake to strike next to the next rad station over here in central Missouri up here by the Arrow. Watch for that in the next few days. See if that happened. I don't know if they'll report it. Anyway, back up to the northwest. That's where our explosion is. Oh, man, that's the king of sidetrack right there. That was the ultimate sidetrack on an explosion from the west coast. Leads us over to here, to there, to there, to there, to there. It's called a rabbit hole chase, guys. Now I got to go check and see what this next earthquake is. We're never going to get through this. Look, another explosion. You got to be kidding me, man. A second 
Are these all explosions? Oh, I get it. Washington's exploding everywhere. That's it. Just exploding everywhere, you know. Why not? The only place in the United States where there's any explosions listed. Now we've got two. Where's this one? Oh, no biggie next to the Air Force Base. Hey, you know. Oh, what is this? This is not an Air Force Base. It looks like one. Look at all those planes. What the hell is this place? Look at that. What are? What is this? Is this the airport graveyard? What is this? Hold on. Borders, labels, places. What is it? I, I don't get it. Raycom Inter... Aerotech Moses Flight Test Center? Why is this not labeled with something that you would think that Columbia Pacific Aviation? Is that what this... I, that, that makes no sense. Why do we not have a big place mark on here with all these? Oh. Hold on. Boeing. It just says Boeing. That's what this is? The Boeing flight facility? Is that where they make all their planes or something? you got to be kidding me, man. You've got to be kidding me. It is? Oh, God. Okay, this update's going to be watched by every freaking agent and every defense department and every, everybody around the world, including our enemies. I better clean my act up, act proper now. All right. All right, folks, let's get proper now. Let's go down into a... Are you freaking kidding me, man. Okay, let's go up to the north and see what this one is. Okay, it, oh, first of all, it's an actual earthquake. So I guess we should be relieved it's not an explosion. Getting explosions next to these weird facilities. Please. Something weird's going on. I wonder what's here. Columbia River. There we go to State Park. Orlando. Oh. Oh. See these? See these huge sets of power lines? They go back down to this hydroelectric dam right here. We've been watching a series of earthquakes go from this hydroelectric dam up along this set of power lines, jump across the river, and go over here to where the power lines carry on over to the west. Another freaking power line earthquake thing. But it's listed as a quake. The good news is that technically it's listed as a quake, so at least it's not an explosion. Which is more suspicious, the earthquakes or the explosions? Both are happening next to weird spots. It's just we have to pay attention to it. Oh, wait. My internet just crashed. No way. My internet just went down. They just shut off my freaking internet, dude. Look. I'm off. I'm off. I'm all bright red. No freaking kidding, dude. All right. All right. Whatever, man. Whatever, guys. Whatever, man.
up the rest and just see are there any other explosions worth mentioning. This is enough, man. This this update right here is enough. I started swearing. I'm sorry. I said the F word twice. Dude. I'm going to have to go in and bleep that out somehow. <laughs> Should I just leave it in? I mean, it is real. This is the real deal. I mean, whatever. Okay. Oh, look, another explosion. Another explosion across Washington. Let's go take a look and see what's there. We're leaving Mount Rainier. I can't believe it, man. Hitting my internet while I'm live recording. Again, it's just, it's foolish. That's now the 1,111th internet outage while live. I've got fiber connection, so. Oh, do they just hit it again? They just hit it again. They just hit it again. They just shut it off again. Well, I'm not going to take it out. I'm not going to take it out. I'll leave, I'll leave it all. I'll leave it all in. So everyone can see what a guy has to go through when he's up against the Department of Interior, the U.S. Gov, every yes-man scientist in the world, a bunch of military freaks, probably foreign agents, and hackers too. And God knows how many kids in basements too, probably all that together, you know. Certainly there's not a lot of love outside of my own sphere of influence but this is what happens when you make a controversial scientific discovery that everybody said was impossible and couldn't be done. The flow of earthquakes going across the plate, documenting it, showing what's at each spot, proving that there's a reason for earthquakes to strike at spots. They're not random. What I'm showing is that earthquakes aren't random. They're striking at specific spots for specific reasons and that, that we can look at that and we can start to forecast based on that. The spread of earthquakes going across Washington, all the explosions going across Washington, the explosions show up before fires. We've seen this so many times. The explosion thing spread. Enough to where we were joking around about was Bubba going around and I make the Bubba joke about Tannerite and target practice. Exploding trees. Okay, I think this update is sufficient. We can talk about California. We have a warning going down in Southern California in the L.A. Basin for up to 5.0 in the next seven days. L.A. Basin, downtown L.A. Now, we are moving all the way around it, down south, down, or over east, over west, but in the middle is where we're watching for a new upper four to low five. My warning for Reno expires today? When did I issue it? Six, seven days ago? It expires today. The warning for Reno. And they're on watch for a 4.9. Hasn't hit yet. There's a big line of earthquakes going from there. Right down to Monte Cristo Hills, Volcanic Buttes. Third worn spot that I don't think most people are paying attention to but need to watch was Colorado. Southern Colorado on watch. Down by Trinidad. And that's for an upper four as well. And the East Coast, everybody's watching for that one. I know a lot of people are watching. Skeptics, deniers, professionals. Whenever I issue a warning for a big earthquake on the East Coast, I know a lot of people watch just to see if it hits. So, All right. That is a heck of an update. Man, you got to see me get shut off. This is, again, I'm live. I'm live and I'm recording. So the recording captured both shutdowns and reconnections without me having... By the way, automatic reconnect. I don't even have to... I have it set to just... It'll do it like up to 20 or 30 times. It'll just sit there and reconnect. So if you keep hitting my internet, it'll just keep sitting there and reconnecting until you stop. <laughs> Whoever you are. And there is a you or they because it's happened a few thousand times now. few thousand times this has happened where I'm on talking live and all of a sudden internet off but I could sit here for days and it's on 
without any problem if I don't talk. Fun stuff. Hey, one more thing. Do you guys have a plan? Do you know what to do when an earthquake strikes? You should take shelter underneath a table or a desk. It's pretty basic. I would say that it's kind of the easiest thing to prepare for, which would be just to have something to get underneath in case there's an earthquake. Now, internationally, people are told to go outside, which would mean you would then kind of treat it like a fire evacuation. You need a pre-designated area to go outside. If you're going outside or if you're staying inside after the earthquake, you'll probably need the emergency kit if it's a big earthquake. Change clothes, set of shoes, flashlight, batteries, first aid kit, sanitation, medicine, recreational or otherwise. Any of your other things that you need. I've got coffee in my emergency kit. I've got a coffee creamer. I even bought a Makita. <laughs> Makita, the tool maker, makes a coffee pot for job sites. It works on your batteries for your screwdriver. I'm that dependent on coffee. But I've got it in the bag. Also some sugar. <laughs> now on the creamer, it's powdered creamer. I know there's going to be people that say it's chemical, but I don't care, man, if it's... <laughs> anyway, I want you guys to be prepared. Will you please have that taken care of, the emergency kit? If you have children, I would suggest maybe even having a separate little bag for them that has the emergency kit for kids. And it has some toys and some other, you know, uh, sugary snacks. and Because imagine what it would be like to be a kid while all the other adults are melting down in a disaster-type situation. And you're a kid. Uh, you just might want to have a few of those things for the, for the kids in your life. Also remember the elderly and the disabled. Even if you know some that are down the street or next door or whatever, if they're not in your family directly, think about that too. Could save a life. What else is going on? Oh, uh, yeah, you know, hey, if you guys want to come over and watch me get my interview on Dark Horse Genetics, they interviewed me last night uh, on the topic. And if you're not aware of the topic, you can come over and find out about the topic. And we're talking about it there. Uh, this is pretty interesting. Again, my uh, my Janich, Janish, Janet Shusky going over to Eastern Europe. Uh, pretty interesting. Pretty interesting on how... One of my possible relatives, again, we're the same last name. It's just we're trying to find out if they're actually related or not. Uh, Janiszewski, pretty specific last name, Janich. And uh, they're the discoverer of autoflowers. And that's a big deal. That's And it's 100 years ago this year in uh, 2024. In 2024 will be the 100th anniversary of their discovery. Anyway, I found that out. We're on talking about that. Pretty interesting stuff. Jason uh, is an awesome guy, real nice guy. And... Uh, good interview there. Check that out if you're into that kind of thing. Also, come over to my community page and just look out for these kind of posts. Big shout out to our local meteorologist. This guy's great, by the way. He doesn't know me and I don't know him. Oh, what's his name? I don't even know his name. Oh, I didn't have it in here. Scott something. Our local meteorologist. I should know his last name. Anyway, they're actually not bad here. Our meteorologist here in St. Louis, they're not bad. They actually know to look for weird things. Long story on how I know that they know, but they're not exactly bad people here. So I would rule out the local meteorologist as the people who are controlling the weather control system. <laughs> Otherwise, we might have a sunny Cardinal game. You know? <laughs> a spot rain shower over the competitive team. It look like there's a little bit of hail over there happening. Oh, where did that come from? <laughs> the potential uses for weather modification gone wrong. Remember Michio Kaku. Michio Kaku getting up talking about lasers and weather control. Michio Kaku laser weather. This is great. This is great. Here he is. I'm not going to play the interview. Hopefully you guys can see this. I'm not going to play the Michio Kaku interview because obviously it's on, what is this, CBS? But he's on here talking about the use of lasers to control the weather. And then he talks about uses for it for weddings. <laughs> weddings, sports events, 
And I'm just like sitting here, I'm just like, I'm face palming this. I'm, I'm like, oh my god, no, no, no. Wedding, some rich chick is gonna get in here, or dude or whatever, and come in. Oh, I wanna have a perfect day for my wedding. I'll pay anything. Yeah, daddy, you'll pay for it. Ah. Oh. Then he says that they had it all the way back in Vietnam and used it over the Viet Cong. And the lady cuts him off and says, allegedly, right? And he goes, oh, yes, 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 allegedly, allegedly. He literally says it. He's like, oh, they had this in the 1970s. CIA used it over Viet Cong. And she's like, she goes, you mean allegedly, right? And he... <laughs> <laughs> the most epic interview from Michio Kaku. I bet he's not that bad of a guy either in real life. Yeah, sure, he might be a shill, but dude, he slipped up there. It was perfect. Oh, now you know why I get cut off and my internet gets shut down. A cubicle farm of guys in camos has a problem. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Shut down Dutch Sense immediately. Yes, sir. Hut, 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 hut. Off. We've got the high-powered blimp over Oklahoma, sir. Target that shit. Yes, sir. Got him. Drone pilot flies over. Got him. They go get their coffee, come out of their cubicle, feeling all good about themselves. You know what I think they should do? I think to make drone pilots in the military more accountable and make it more serious that they'd be put in some kind of taser chair. And if their drone gets shot at or shot down, that they experience an appropriate pain signal to their body while they're flying their drone, taking out the enemy. So that way, there's some physicality to it. There's some consequence to getting shot down or to doing the wrong thing. That's it. Some kind of pilot's taser chair for them. <laughs> oh, you shouldn't have shut off my internet, man. We'd just be doing a regular update right now. Perfect time to sign off. 1-11 a.m. Nothing go wrong there. Peace out.